Good evening, I'm Judy Woodruff. On the news hour tonight, another cabinet secretary exit. David Shulkin is out as President Trump names White House physician Ronnie Jackson to head Veterans Affairs. Then in his first trip outside of North Korea since becoming its leader, Kim Jong-un meets with China's president in Beijing. Plus, the global risk of over-prescribing antibiotics. Why the rise in drug treatment all over the world threatens the spread of superbugs. And Syrians find peace in Scotland. How a small group of refugees running from war are building a new life on the Isle of Bute. That feeling of um, no fear leaves them within the space of mm, maybe a few weeks. You can see it in their faces, in their eyes. All that and more on tonight's PBS NewsHour. President Trump has fired his Secretary of Veterans Affairs, David Shulkin. He had faced criticism over travel expenses and poor care at, T at VA health centers. The president tweeted this evening that he is nominating his personal physician, Navy Rear Admiral Ronnie Jackson, to be the new Secretary of the Department. For more on this breaking story, I'm joined now by Lisa Rhine of The Washington Post. Lisa, thank you for joining us. We just learned about this just about half an hour ago. What do we know about what problems uh, had arisen with Secretary Shulkin? So, Judy, this um, ousting of, of uh, Dr. Shulkin was widely expected. Um, it had been expected for weeks uh, because while Dr. Shulkin had been a favorite cabinet member of the president's uh, for many, many months, uh, he fell out of favor after an inspector general report criticized a trip that he took to Europe that, uh, that was lavish, that involved his accepting a gift of improper Wimbledon tickets. And then Dr. Shulkin did himself no favors by pushing back hard against the report uh, and also by uh, going to the press repeatedly and talking about an insurrection that was afoot inside VA to oust him over his uh, policy differences on private care for veterans. So that's really what tipped the scales uh, for Dr. Shulkin. Now, he had been, if I remember correctly, the only holdover from the Obama uh, administration. And I think we have been reading that he and the president had developed a good relationship. They had, in fact, a number of uh, months ago, the president, uh, who famously says you're fired at the uh, Oval Office um, at a, an appearance, said, oh, we'll never say that about our David, meaning Secretary Shulkin. Uh, but this president um, is volatile often in his opinions of, of who serves him. And Dr. Shulkin, by all accounts, uh, you know, was a very, very competent um, former hospital administrator who had run big hospital systems. Um, but when you fall out of favor with the president, it is hard to get your footing back. And that's, that's what happened here. And just quickly, what do we know about Dr. Ronnie Jackson? Right. So the choice of, of Dr. Jackson was really, I think, a surprise to, um, to most of us. Uh, there were the, ca the dis people who the president was considering, the names were tightly held. We know that uh, Jackson is a rear admirable, admiral and the president uh, really likes people in the military. It's actually unclear, though, whether he, uh, he's still on active duty. So the question is, will he retire? Uh, because the VA is a civilian job. Will he retire or will he seek a waiver, um, as former National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster did, uh, from, uh, from co co the Congress to continue serving in an active duty capacity? Um, he has not run a large organization like VA. Um, few people have, 370,000 employees. Uh, and the other thing we don't know about Admiral Jackson uh, are his views on privatization of VA which I think is kind of the biggest hot-button policy issue now that is really under debate, which is how much private care should veterans in the, in the system be allowed to seek outside the system? Well, a number of questions uh, which uh, we'll all be seeking answers to. Again, this uh, news just broke within the hour. Lisa Ryan with The Washington Post, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.
In another major development, it has been rumored for days, and now it's confirmed. Kim and Xi have met. The leaders of China and North Korea held an unofficial summit this week, but they waited until today to announce it to the world. It was a high-stakes visit shrouded in secrecy. Inside Beijing's Great Hall of the People, China's President Xi Jinping and North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un came face-to-face -face for the first time. Speculation began Monday when video surfaced of an armored green train traveling from North Korea to China. But only after the train left on Tuesday did China's state TV broadcast images of Kim meeting with Xi and other senior officials. North Korea made its own announcement. A historical event that elevates North Korea-Chinese relations to a higher level. This was Kim's first venture abroad since he became North Korea's supreme leader in 2011, and his state-controlled media hailed it as a milestone. Dear Supreme Leader said that he wants to meet President Xi Jinping and other Chinese comrades more often. China has long been North Korea's ally and patron, but tensions mounted as Kim built a nuclear arsenal and tested missiles against Beijing's warnings. During the visit, however, Xi and Kim toasted the friendship between their countries. Moreover, Chinese state news quoted Kim as saying, if South Korea and the United States respond with goodwill, the issue of the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula can reach resolution. China also said she applauded Kim for, quote, promising changes in the situation and offered to help. President Xi highlighted that China will continue with its constructive role and stands ready to work with all parties, including North Korea. The next stop on Kim's diplomatic tour is a meeting with South Korea's President Moon Jae-in next month, and then, possibly, with President Trump in May. Mr. Trump welcomed the prospect on Twitter today. He said, now there is a good chance that Kim Jong-un will do what is right for his people and for humanity. Look forward to our meeting. In Japan, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe said today that the U.S. must address not just North Korea's long-range missiles, but shorter-range missiles that can reach Japan. He also warned North Korea to keep any promises it makes. What's important is not dialogue for dialogue's sake, but to achieve nuclear and missile dismantling in a completely verifiable and irreversible way. But the North's latest concrete action is new cause for concern. Satellite pictures show increased activity at an experimental nuclear reactor site. And according to reports, another reactor may have resumed producing plutonium that can be used in nuclear weapons. We'll look more in-depth at Kim's meeting with Xi right after the news summary. In the day's other news, the U.S. and South Korea have reached a new trade agreement after President Trump said the existing deal was a job killer. It is widely reported that the new version will double U.S. auto exports to South Korea. In turn, the South is exempted from the president's 25 percent tariffs on steel, but it must limit steel exports to the U.S. Poland signed a major deal today to buy U.S. Patriot missile defense systems to counter Russia. The agreement is worth nearly $5 billion, and it comes as Warsaw is modernizing its military. Overall, it is Poland's largest weapons deal in nearly 30 years. In Russia, flags flew at half-staff on a national day of mourning for the victims of a Siberian shopping mall fire. Officials say 64 people died many of them children. The first funerals were held today in the city of Kemerovo. At one service, mourners gathered around the coffins of a grandmother and her two grandchildren. In Moscow, people attended a separate memorial and demanded justice. The guilty must be found no matter what, for the simple purpose that this must never happen again so that money would not be able to buy everything. Life is not for sale. Oh, Lord, may the Lord save us. 
As the investigation continues, officials now say a short circuit may have started the fire. They also say emergency exits were locked. Several mall employees have been arrested and charged. Back in this country, a federal judge says that a lawsuit accusing President Trump of violating the Constitution's emoluments clause may go to trial. Maryland and the District of Columbia allege that the president has received improper payments from foreign governments through his D.C. hotel. There have been several similar suits, but this is the first one allowed to proceed. President Trump went today after a former Supreme Court Justice, John Paul Stevens, who called for repealing the Second Amendment, arguing that it would clear the way for gun control. In response, Mr. Trump tweeted that, quote, the Second Amendment will never be repealed. He went on to say that Republicans, quote, must always hold the Supreme Court. Facebook is changing its privacy options. That is after a consulting firm affiliated with the Trump campaign accessed and used data from 50 million Facebook users. The social media giant says that users will be better able to navigate privacy and security settings and see the data that is being gathered. On Wall Street, stocks had a choppy day. The Dow Jones Industrial Average lost nine points to close at 23,848. The Nasdaq fell 59 points, and the S&P 500 slipped seven. And the Labrador Retriever is still America's top dog. Labs lead the American Kennel Club's popularity rankings for the 27th straight year, followed by German Shepherds and Golden Retrievers. The French Bulldog has surged to fourth. It is up more than 70 slots from 20 years ago. Still to come on the news hour, what we should read into the meeting between Kim Jong-un and Xi Jinping. The Supreme Court takes on political gerrymandering. Egyptians facing a declining economy head to the polls and much more. Returning to our lead story, the visit to China by North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un. What should we make of the trip and what does it mean for the U.S.? Michael Pillsbury has been advising the Trump administration on Korea. He's a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, where he directs the Center for Chinese Strategy. And Michael Green was the senior director for Asia on the National Security Council staff during the George W. Bush administration. He's now senior vice president for Asia at the Center for Strategic and International Studies and a professor at Georgetown University. And gentlemen, we thank you both for being here. Michael Pillsbury, to you first. How, do we know how this trip came about? I would say the short answer is no. Uh, a senior intelligence official in South Korea told the press uh, a couple of days ago, this is not uh, Kim, this is his sister. Very embarrassing intelligence failure from South Korea. A number of American China experts have tweeted out, there's high officials on the train, but no one else. So unless it's extremely sensitive American intelligence, I would say the answer is no. However, we know a lot more about it now. We've had the Xi phone call to Trump. We've had the long Chinese statement, and we've had some communications with the Chinese. I myself have talked to the Chinese about what happened and well, how they claim they're trying to help us, and I think that's true. I think they are trying to help President Trump. But they clearly extended the invitation, and Kim accepted. Michael Green... What does the North Korean leader get out of this trip, based on what we've been told? Um, well, for now, it's quite a propaganda coup. Um, Kim Jong-un uh, is going to be able to tell his people in the world that after defying the UN Security Council, the international community, with multiple missile and nuclear weapons tests, the leaders of the world want to meet with him uh, as the leader of a nuclear weapon state. So just on the face of it, he's uh, gained quite a coup. What he'll hope to get next is Chinese help uh, weakening the sanctions and pressure on him. Uh, whether or not the Chinese help him will depend in part on how effectively the United States, together with Japan and Korea, keep pressure on uh, and keep China focused on getting something more concrete than what we've seen so far. Michael Pillsbury, you agree there are a number of things that yes. he gets from this? I do. Uh, in many ways, you got a clue at the end of the Chinese statement who Chairman Kim, or the young General Kim, he likes to be called, brought with him. He brought his propaganda chief. It's called the uh, Workers' Party United Front Department Director. So he's obviously focused on just what Mike Green says. 
uh, getting some international credibility, making sure there's no errors on this trip. It looked like, from his point of view, it came off very well. However, he does, in the Chinese account of what happened, he does sound very junior. Uh, he's filled with praise for President Xi. Uh, he responded that President Xi said, you know, we need to have more meetings, we need to have special envoys, we need to be exchanging letters. Don't leave me out of the loop ever again, seemed to be President Xi's meaning. And there's a kind of commitment, according because to the Chinese. Because he had been left out of the loop. Yes. Uh, yes. With this negotiation uh, decision the, to meet the president. As you know, the Economist magazine calls President Xi the most powerful man in the world. But he doesn't know what's going on in his own backyard. So he had to settle some embarrassing uh, matters of what is owed. They used the term moral commitment. The reason uh, young General Kim has come to report is out of moral commitment to China. Mm -hmm. I thought that was particularly telling. But still, overall, this is a big triumph for President Trump. Don't forget, last Thursday, slapped the Chinese in the face almost with the tariffs, the announcement of the lawsuit, you know, the crackdown on technology. And four days later, we have the Chinese helping us quite a bit with the young general. Michael Green, a big triumph for President Trump. And what does it mean for the prospects for the summit, a, a, a summit? Well, if there's a summit, uh, because um, while it's clear that Kim Jong-un has gotten some propaganda mileage out of this, it's not clear yet what we get. Doesn't mean we won't get anything, but first round goes to Kim Jong-un. The only indication out of the meeting between Xi and Kim Jong-un that there might be some uh, intention to talk about nuclear weapons is the statement that the North Korean leader apparently made that he continues to favor denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, which President Trump highlighted in his tweet. Mm -hmm. But anyone who's negotiated North Korea, and I have, knows when the, that when the North Koreans say denuclearization of the mm -hmm. Korean Peninsula, they mean after the United States stops protecting South Korea and Japan. It's, it's, a, it's a nothing burger. There's no there there. So, That's a very good point. Uh, so we'll have to see. There's no indication I can see at all that there's any concrete uh, move uh, intended by North Korea to do anything of significance. So the next round will be critical. So, so Michael Pillsbury, how do you see the prospects for the summit after this? You said you think it's good for President Trump, but denuclearization, what, is it, what, what does it mean? Well, that's the precise problem. I mean, there's a problem of who goes first. Perhaps Secretary of State Pompeo could go first, or Ambassador Nikki Haley. Uh, that's what President Clinton did. Uh, you mean to meet with Kim To meet Kim with Jong the young general. But uh, the issue of denuclearization is a, a, what I've been talking about a lot with the new uh, Trump advisors. Uh, it's just what Mike Green says. There's two different definitions of it. It sounds like when we hear it, it means he's going to get rid of all his nuclear weapons. That's not his definition. His definition is he will make a judgment, and he said it could be as long as 10 to 20 years from now, whether he feels secure because the Americans have withdrawn completely from South Korea, canceled our treaty. You know, he's going to decide denuclearization. It's not even clear he could, if he could keep some nuclear weapons, you know, in 20 years. So this is going to be the key sticking point for the summit. And frankly, I'm not one of those who believes we have to make a deadline, you know, in mid-May. Right. I'm for a postponement, if necessary, to get clarification on just this one word, denuclearization. What are we really getting together to talk about? Because, Michael Green, the US, there's, that's not in the cards at this point. I mean, maybe years from now, the U.S., thinks about removing troops in in some form or fashion, but that's not in the near term at all, is it? No. And I've heard North Korean diplomats, when I was in the White House, uh, use this term in the UN, in Pyongyang, in Beijing, mm -hmm. eventually we'll denuclearize after you. <laughs> Um, uh, after everything we, we no want. longer, after so, we feel secure. So after Mike makes secure. an important point. If, if President Trump goes into this with no preparation, um, and, and, and based on his tweet, he said that Kim Jong-un might do the right thing, but he's basing that on this statement about, quote unquote, denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, which doesn't mean anything. So a much better approach for President Trump would be to have a series of preparatory meetings to find out what the real there there is. It's not clear that he wants to do that or not, but if Mike's advising him and others are telling him, get lower level talks clarified, that's very good advice. And meantime, you have these reports of new activity at the reactor, uh, the reactor sites. So a lot of questions still. The Michael summit Green. would clearly be canceled, I think, if there's a provocation by North Korea, a nuclear test or a long-range missile test toward Guam, something like that. That would be clearly be a deal uh, breaker. We will be watching it all, and I know you will. Michael Green, Michael Pillsbury, thank you both. Thank you. Thank you.
The Supreme Court delved once again into a high-stakes, long-running political debate today. What is and is not allowed when lawmakers draw electoral districts? Jeffrey Brown explores the legal dividing lines. In October, the court heard a case from Wisconsin arguing the state's political map had been unconstitutionally redrawn to favor Republicans. Today, another case, another state, with a claim that a Maryland district was redrawn to help Democrats. As always, Marsha Coyle, chief Washington correspondent for the National Law Journal, was in the courtroom for the arguments. Welcome back first. Thanks, Jeff. And first, this term, extreme partisan gerrymandering. We know politics is always involved in this, Absolutely. but it's a question of how far you can go. That's right. That's the exact question. And also, how do you measure it? What kind of a test or standard do you use to root it out? So tell us about the Maryland case. Uh, back in 2013, a group of Republican voters uh, filed a lawsuit claiming that the Democratic uh, Maryland General Assembly had engaged in a partisan gerrymander when it redrew the district lines for the 6th Congressional District. The General Assembly had basically flipped it from a safe Republican district mm -hmm. to a Democratic district. These voters claimed that that was a violation of their First Amendment rights because they were singled out and retaliated against because of their voting views. A lower federal court would not issue an injunction, temporary injunction, blocking that map mm -hmm. of the 6th District, and the uh, voters brought that case to the Supreme Court. And as I said, the court had heard this earlier case in Wisconsin. The legal argument in Maryland was the First Amendment different from Wisconsin? Right. In the Wisconsin case, the challengers who did win after a trial had based their claim on the Equal Protection Clause. They said that the state legislature had cracked and packed Democratic votes in order to dilute their effectiveness. That was a violation of equal protection of law. Okay, so what did you hear today in the court? Well, basically, I, I think there were three things. Uh, almost immediately off the bat, Justice Ginsburg uh, and Justice Kennedy wondered, is it too late to be dealing with this because of the November midterm elections? If anything, the court decided in favor of these voters. Was there time enough for the lower court to to see that a new map could be adopted? So because uh, they don't want to they don't want to decide things that are moot. That's right. And yeah. Justice Kennedy pointed out that if they did that, wouldn't we, uh, wouldn't the court, we be upsetting settled expectations, disrupting the election process? So that was obviously very much on their minds mm -hmm. and might portend a narrow ruling if enough justices feel strongly that they don't want to go down that road. The bulk of the arguments really focused on the legal theory here, the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeff, as you know, in 2004, the court kind of threw up its hands about partisan gerrymandering, saying uh, we can't come up with a test, a standard uh, that lower courts can use. It's interesting. It's one of these things that's been around forever, but the court has never been able to decide, never decided. Right, exactly. Yeah. And when the court took the Wisconsin and the Maryland case, it sort of indicated they were willing to try again to find that test. Mm -hmm. Is it the First Amendment? Uh, Justice Alito was skeptical. He said that he felt that under that legal theory, uh, a legislature would never be able to redistrict if even the if there was just a trifle bit of uh, partisanship, there could be a constitutional violation. Justice Kennedy seemed a little more open to it. In fact, uh, he, he said he felt that, you know, this might be the kind of case where the First Amendment does fit. So you came away thinking, well, you know, here we go again. They, they seem decided unsure as to whether the First Amendment is the right test. And the political implications are potentially major. Absolutely. Uh, whatever the court decides, especially if it finds a test, uh, could revamp how districts are drawn across the country. And it's also, you know, very important for your right to vote. I mean, if you live in a district uh, that has been rejiggered, its lines are rejiggered so that um, uh, the outcome is foreordained, mm -hmm. are you going to vote? Do you feel you ha your vote has any value? And uh, I think that's the other big consideration here as to why the justices are looking at this. They're very aware of the potential implications. They are, as well as the possibility that they could be opening the door to many partisan gerrymandering lawsuits. All right. Marsha Coyle, as always, the National Law Journal. Thank you very much. My pleasure, Jeff.
Three days of voting ended today in Egypt's presidential election. The outcome is not in doubt. President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi ran with no real opposition. As Hari Srinivasan reports, seven years after the uprising there, democracy is further from reach amid economic and security problems. President al-Sisi cast his ballot at one of the country's 13,000 polling stations. But his re-election was never really a question. And his lone opponent, Mosa Mustafa, heads a party that had endorsed Sisi. Other opponents were intimidated to withdraw or were arrested. Khalid Ali is an attorney who had dropped out of the running. All these indicators were pointing towards planned intentions to poison and corrupt the entire operation and to evacuate it from its presumed democratic meaning. Dozens of opposition figures and seven political parties called for an election boycott. Turnout, a key metric for Sisi, was low. Still, Sisi has strong political support, at least in parliament. More than 80 percent of its members support him. And relations with Israel and the United States are firm. President Trump welcomed him to the White House last spring. Political science professor Dalia Fahmy specializes in the and Middle so East. The future of U.S.-Egyptian relations is going to have to take into account a couple of things. Will we really take seriously the democratic aspirations of the Egyptian people, which should lead to further stability? Or will we rethink U.S. strategy towards Egypt and U.S. strategy towards stability in the region as a whole? In 2013, Sisi ousted then-President Mohamed Morsi, Egypt's first democratically elected president, after the 2011 uprising that deposed longtime leader Hosni Mubarak. A year later, Sisi won more than 96 percent of the vote. Sisi has led a harsh security crackdown, imprisoning thousands. Sisi has gone after free expression, civil society, and rivals both in the political and military realm, says Fahmy. Instead of building schools and in other infrastructure projects, he has actually had to build 16 new prisons. Um, he has had a major clampdown on, on media, both domestic and international. But his popularity has been hurt by a bad economy. Strict economic reforms were enacted in 2016 to avoid insolvency. Inflation skyrocketed with food prices rising by 30 percent. And while unemployment is around 11 percent, almost 80 percent of those without jobs are young people. All this as Sisi prosecutes a war with an ISIS-affiliated insurgency in the Sinai Peninsula. Armed groups there have killed more than 700 civilians and at least 1,000 security forces since 2014. In 2015, militants blew up a Russian civilian airliner, killing more than 200 people on board. Sisi ratcheted up to fight, but the insurgency persists. But Sisi isn't fighting this war alone. Egypt receives more than a billion dollars in U.S. military aid every year. The United States just announced that there will be um, a furthering of engagement and joint tactical missions in Sinai, which they have been doing for decades. Um, but this increase lends itself to signal that the U.S. administration believes that it needs to play an increasing role in the region because Egypt cannot secure the region for itself. The official results of the election will be announced Monday. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Hari Srinivasan. And now for the second part of my wide-ranging interview with former President Jimmy Carter. We spoke in New York ahead of the release of his latest book, Faith, A Journey for All. I asked him about how his own faith has been tested over the years, most recently when doctors discovered four spots of cancer in his brain. Well, I was really surprised when I felt that I only had two or three weeks to live, and I was perfectly at ease with it. I was prepared to have the end of my life come, and I was in, infected in a very beneficial way with a, just an appreciation of what my life had been, and luckily they treated my brain with uh, radiation, and then I got a new treatment that, that enhanced my immune system, and only about a third of the people respond favorably to that kind of treatment, but I was one of those one-thirds, so I was very lucky. Did your faith get you through that time? I do you think, think so. I've been religious all my life, I guess, and, and I think that, that enhanced my ability to accommodate the prospect of, of death. President Carter, there's such a high level of polarization in this country right now, and you write about it in the book, the 
It's rural versus urban. It's left versus right, red versus blue. Do you think there's a way to get beyond this? I think a lot of it is, is due to the massive influx of money into the campaigns. When I ran against Gerald Ford, who was the president of the United States then, you know how much money we raised for the general elections? Zero. I would like to see the money aspect to elections reduced in this country dramatically. The Supreme Court, though, has said the money Supreme equals Court, speech. I, I don't have much confidence in the Supreme Court doing this. But one thing that the Supreme Court is considering that would help is to do away with the gerrymandering, that is, a, the acquisition of power by either the Republican or Democratic Party within a state. I mean, I talk to people all around the country who say, and I'm sure you hear it, that they feel that members of families can't even talk among themselves about American politics. Well, that's, that's true. I think that uh, massive use of money and the power that, that goes to the people who give a lot of money to a candidate uh, has uh, resulted in this vast disparity in income in America and has resulted in, in the polarization more than any other single factor. And corrupted politics? I think it's corrupted it in a way, although I can't say against the law, because the law is established by the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court seems to be eager to see rich people uh, become more powerful and, and to see corporations become more powerful than individuals uh, with, their, with their previous rulings. So I, I think with the presently constituted Supreme Court, there's very little chance that we'll see money removed from, from politics. President Carter, the recent school, terrible school shooting in Parkland, Florida. This follows a string of other horrible incidents in schools around our country. Now we see these young people, high school students, leading the way, saying they're not going to rest until something changes, and yet the laws don't seem to change. Congress has not responded. Do you think something could be different this time? I do. I think they've already shown their, their ability to change legislation in Florida. I think the arousing of uh, young people all over the country, which they did this past weekend, uh, is a good indication that uh, they'll have a permanent, more permanent effect on the uh, counteracting the NRA's false uh, premises. But the NRA has enormous influence. You write about it in the book. Uh, you've dealt with it for years. You really believe that can be um, pushed back? I don't have much confidence in it, but I think if anybody can do it, these young people, if they stick with it, I think the NRA is facing the greatest challenge that it has in the last 15 or 20 years. President Carter, you've been married to the same woman for, I think, 72 years, is that yeah, right? Yeah, almost 73. Rosalind, we'll make it to July. <laughs> Rosalind Carter, um, how do you process the stories in recent weeks and months about women who allege either affairs with President Trump or sexual harassment by President Trump? Well, I think that President Trump's solid base of support is going to be unshaken by it. For many people, perhaps marginal groups enough to sway the election in 2018 and 2020 will be affected adversely against Trump because of his reports of uh, multiple women, I think 17 or 18 women, I've forgotten how many, who have alleged previous uh, sexual escapades with President Trump even after he was married. So, so this is something that uh, is regrettable, but the revelation of it, uh, I think, has been shaken off by most of his core supporters. Should it factor into how we assess the character, the performance of a president in office, to know these kinds of things? I think it should be factored in, yes. But I think for some of the marginal voters that might sway the election toward Democrats uh, in 2018, uh, I think, I think that, that might certainly be a major factor. I hope so. You, of course, were the antidote to the Nixon years. Do you see a Democrat out there who could be the Jimmy Carter of 2020? <laughs> well, of course, the Jimmy Carter of 2020 would be almost uh, uh, unidentifiable at this point because I came out of nowhere. But uh, 
I think there's some very good people on the horizon. Joe Biden is one of them, former, former vice president, and and uh, and others. I don't want to start naming them. Elizabeth Warren and, and others uh, could could be good presidents. Uh, so you you'll definitely vote Democratic in 2020. Of course, okay. if I'm alive then. <laughs> President Jimmy Carter, thank you very much for talking with us. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Vivi. Since Syria's civil war began, the U.N. says 12 million Syrians have been forced to leave their homes, with another one and a half million expected to leave this year. The recent bombardment of eastern Ghouta highlights the need for new sanctuaries. As Malcolm Brabant reports, this is being watched with concern on a Scottish island, where a small Syrian community has been warmly welcomed. And a warning, you may find some images in this story disturbing. A short ferry ride from Scotland's west coast lies the Isle of Bute. Once a flourishing vacation destination for workers from Glasgow, the island's population has shrunk and its economy has withered. The arrival of 24 Syrian families is contributing to an atmosphere of regeneration. A little bit longer to talk. Like uh, usually here, yeah. but here shorter. More shorter, yeah. please. Munza al Dasani used to have a barber shop in Damascus and has become the first Syrian to set up his own business on the island. Others, including a bakery, are in the pipeline. The people here are very, very nice, very helpful. Uh, they gave us uh, a big help when we came and uh, still help us for everything. Al Dasani's client base is growing thanks to recommendations from customers like police officer Andrew Wilson, who approves the decision to give the Syrian sanctuary. I think it's a very positive thing for the island. Um, you know, the island itself is predominantly an elderly kind of community, so it's it's always it's good to get the kind of fresh kind of blood to the island. Um, and Munzi, I've, I've been coming here now since since he came. Um, just he's, he's really good at his job as well. Al Dasani is proud that his work ethic is recognised in Butte, but speaking in his native Arabic expresses sadness that the island's hospitality has not been replicated elsewhere in Europe. Unfortunately, the European governments think the Syrians are going to come and there will be an Islamic takeover. We never thought about this. We never thought about this. Actually, we are running from ISIS. We are running from these groups to find safety and so that we and our children can live in safety. Just around the corner, a former builder from Damascus is repaying what he sees as his debt to Butte by volunteering in Angela Callahan's charity shop. Ahmed asked us not to reveal his identity because he fears retribution against family members still in Syria. I am happy. I am very happy. Me and uh, every family. Ahmed is taking English lessons, but the language is proving difficult. Here there's no war and no airstrikes, but in Syria we ran from the war and airstrikes. The children are very happy. Our family is very happy here. There are no problems at all. We ran from the problems and from Bashar al-Assad. The latest images from eastern Ghouta underpin Ahmed's sense of gratitude. We watch the news a lot. Our heart is broken for our people in Syria, from the airstrikes and the war. A lot of sad images. Me and my children and my wife have decided to stay in Scotland. We will not return to Syria. Angela Callahan was instrumental in making the Syrians welcome. After surviving breast cancer, she devoted her life to charity. Any profits from her second-hand shop fund a food bank that serves the poorest islanders. I see television, same as anybody else. I see the news at night. I go to my friends' houses, I listen to their, their stories, which mostly are horrifying, and I just couldn't even imagine being there myself. And I, I, I just think, in coming to a place like this, where it's tranquil, stunning, people are nice, that feeling of um, no fear, 
leaves them within the space of mm, maybe a few weeks. You can see it in their faces, in their eyes. A lot of them are putting down roots, um, and I would actually say just about all of them. They have settled in fantastic. They've all got friends, um, got people that come to their houses for a wee cup of tea, like, like I do quite often, <laughs> you know. Most Syrians were unwilling to talk because of fear that their families might be targeted. Craft brewer Aidan Canavan is highly protective of the newcomers. The problems came from the people of Butte who had perceptions that uh, you, they wouldn't be able to celebrate Christmas, they wouldn't be able to uh, eat bacon at school. The, all these rumours went around. None of them were true. It was just fabricated stories that went around. We live in a time of different cultures. Peter Atkins is a Baptist minister. He believes Butte offers opportunities for the Syrians, but worries that, like other islanders, they may struggle to find employment. With his Jamaican heritage, Atkins understands the complexities of integration. Whatever you do, it takes time. It takes time. The Syrians are learning English, they're, they're chatty, you, you speak to them in the street, um, and all the, all the signs are good. Um, but at the same time, it's a different situation from, from my grandparents, for example, because they're refugees. You know, they, they didn't intend to come here. This wasn't a life plan, this wasn't intentional. And should the Syrian situation become more positive in five or 10 years, we would expect that they would leave. So it's difficult to, to settle and make integration plans with, with, that, with that context, although Syria is not really giving us much cause for hope on that front. The goodwill towards refugees on this island is unmistakable. But three years into the migration crisis, the European Union remains deeply divided. Former communist nations are resolutely refusing to take in any refugees. EU leaders have been asked to thrash out a common policy to handle future influxes so that the burden can be fairly shared. But the split is so profound that some experts believe there will not be any agreement. While he consolidates his business, Al Dasani's heart and mind is never far from Syria. For now, I am here. I am living my life normally and in safety. But I can't avoid the distressing scenes on television, the helpless situation of the Syrian people, and the international community's complicity. Tragically, all humanity is lost. I simply ask the international community and anyone to think. If something like this happened to you, would you accept it? There's nothing the people of Butte can do to bring peace to Syria, but individually they're furthering the cause of human understanding. Because they're part of my family and I'm part of their family and I know that. Because he calls me his sister and he's my brother. <laughs> yes, my brother. Life is complex for the Syrians, but it must go on. Syrian children are being born here, in peace, and as always, imbued with their parents' hope that their future will be better. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Malcolm Brabant on the Isle of Butte. Now, the enormous benefits and significant perils of the recent upsurge in the availability of antibiotics around the world. Lisa Desjardins talks to Miles O'Brien about the latest research. It's part of our weekly science series, The Leading Edge. Antibiotic resistance contributes to the death of 700,000 people around the world each year. Experts have predicted it will eclipse the number of people affected by cancer by 2050. One of the biggest causes is the overuse of antibiotics. On Monday, a group led by researchers from the Center for Disease Dynamics, Economics and Policy released a new study looking at the global consumption of antibiotics. They found the use of antibiotics worldwide has increased 65 percent from 2000 to 2015. Miles O'Brien is here to help us understand this latest study. Miles, first of all, just remind us, how does the overuse of antibiotics lead to these resistant diseases, sometimes called superbugs? Hello, Lisa. Yes, what happens is antibiotics kill bacteria that make us sick. That's the simple explanation. But the bacteria over time evolve and develop uh, an ability to survive the onslaught of the antibiotics. They, in essence, get smart. So over time, bacteria survive that have resistance built into the antibiotic themselves. Alexander Fleming, 
who invented penicillin, discovered penicillin just before World War II, warned against its overuse precisely because of this. Here's a few more words about how antibiotic resistance works from Dr. Helen Boucher of the Tufts University Medical Center. Resistance happens naturally. So bacteria have various mechanisms to survive. And so if they're presented with an environment that is not so good, that is there's an antibiotic trying to break through their cell wall, they might build a stronger cell wall. Or they might, uh, if there's an antibiotic coming in, they might pump it out. So they figure out ways to evade the effect of the antibiotic. So this study should give us quite a bit of pause because it means with more antibiotics in use, there are more bugs out there that develop the resistance, so-called superbugs. And now we have a much better global picture of the scope of the problem. That seems to be what's new here is just the scope of this study, 76 countries worth of data over 15 years. And where did they see the biggest increases in antibiotic use, obviously globally, but where specifically? So, Lisa, they found the biggest contributor to this problem is in low- to mid-income countries. Back in 2000, the usage of antibiotics in the lower- to mid-income countries versus high-income countries was about equal. In 2015, the usage in those low- to mid-income countries doubled. So that's a significant thing. That's good news for these countries. It means that GDP is in improved, income is greater, they have access to these drugs. All these things are good, uh, but the consequences of their overuse are just magnified. Here is Ailey Klein, who is the lead author of this study. Unlike in high-income countries where when you go to the, the, the primary uh, barrier to getting antibiotics is you have to go to the doctor to see to get a prescription. In many low and middle income countries, the, the barrier is the ability to afford the drugs. And so increased economic activity allows for increased uh, ability to purchase all sorts of things, all types of goods, including antibiotics. Okay, so the good news is that in the higher income countries, the increase in antibiotics use is only about 6 percent. So the, the knowledge of this problem and the efforts to guard against it may be having some effect. Uh, but this is a real conundrum for people in medicine, Lisa, because doctors, on an individual basis, they want to make us well. And they probably have about five minutes to diagnosis anyway. And so in the individual case, it might make most sense to give that z pack to that patient. But they also need to be thinking about society at large. And that's not an easy thing to weigh when you're looking at a patient who's sick and could use those antibiotics to feel better. And I think that's my biggest question here. This study really gives me, and I think many of our viewers, a lot of pause. But the incentives, as you say, all go the other way toward prescribing antibiotics right now. Does this study have any recommendations for how to lower our use of antibiotics appropriately? You know, it's interesting. The recommendations were uh, a little bit surprising to me. One of them was we should be more focused on getting people vaccinated. Well, on the face of it, well, wait a minute. Vac vaccines are for viruses, not bacteria, which is what we're talking about here. But what happens is people get sick from viruses. Uh, doctors mistakenly give those people antibiotics, which do nothing for viruses, and that just furthers the problem. Another thing that was discussed in the paper is the idea that as these emerging nations grow, as cities become more populated, the issue of clean water and sanitation, uh, the, the, the sources of many uh, diarrheal diseases need to be focused on a lot more because that is ultimately why people uh, seek out antibiotics in many cases. Here's more from Ellie Klein. If you look at the history of uh, the high-income countries in the 20th century, the primary driver that reduced infectious diseases was uh, improvements in infrastructure, uh, reducing, uh, el eliminating uh, bacteria and other diseases from the water. Um, and so investments in infrastructure, investments in vaccines that can prevent diseases can be a, uh, a really beneficial um, can be really beneficial to low- and middle-income countries in, in terms of preventing disease and then reducing the need for antibiotics. There, Ailey Klein laid out the hope, the prescription, but if society does not actually deal with this problem, what happens in the future if we do not lower our antibiotic consumption? Well, this is something we all really need to pay attention to, Lisa. The projections are, by 2030, our use of antibiotics, if nothing changes, 
will be triple what it is today. And uh, what that means is there are going to be many more antibiotics which become uh, really just basically useless, more so-called superbugs out there. And we are facing the prospect of a post-antibiotic world. Uh, we take for granted these miracle drugs, which really since World War II have just dramatically changed medicine in ways that uh, it would take too long to enumerate right now. But we could get back to a world, Lisa, if nothing is done, where something as simple as a cut or a blister could kill you, which is what the world was like before we had antibiotics. So it's time, this is like a slow motion train wreck. Researchers have been warning us all about it, and uh, it kind of reminds me a little bit of climate change. Uh, but it's time to get a handle on this because uh, right now, more than a half million people a year globally are dying for lack of antibiotics. Something for each of us to think very carefully about. Miles O'Brien, thank you for bringing us this story. You're welcome, Lisa. Now to our news hour share, something that caught our eye. While most of the country is ready for spring, I know I am, some extreme athletes out west are more than happy to savor the last bit of winter. Julia Griffin teamed up with Montana PBS for this report. In Big Sky, Montana earlier this month, snow fell gracefully and seasoned skiers readied for competition. But hold your horses. This was not your average ski race. Welcome to the rough and tumble world of ski joring. Ski joring is a horse and rider pulling a skier through a series of gates and jumps in the least amount of time possible. Scott Ping has been a ski joring rider for more than 20 years. My horse Kona is the best ride ever. I just sit there and go, yeah, <laughs> that's all I do. He does all the work. Riders like Ping tow their teammates through a 700 foot obstacle course at nearly 35 miles an hour. The skiers weave among slalom gates and launch from snowpack jumps. Should they drop their rope or fail to stay upright, the team's run is disqualified. You want to go fast, but you don't want to go too fast as to where you lose your skier. Horse lover Melissa Ostrander ran the entire Montana ski joring circuit this year. You got to pay attention to your skier. You got to know your horse and you got to control your horse. That's, that's the hardest part about being a rider. Is, is making sure that you don't hurt anyone else, your horse, your skier, anybody around here, and making it fun for everyone. While the name may be unfamiliar, ski joring isn't new. A version of the adrenaline-filled sport was an exhibition event at the 1928 Olympics in St. Moritz, Switzerland. We're coming around to the halfway point. Today, participants of all ages and experience levels compete across the U.S. and Canada. Pete Jensen and his wife Anna are full-time ski patrollers at Big Sky Resort. They race together at ski joring events. She says couples that play together stay together, and I say anytime you can put two sports together, it's twice as fun. She likes going fast on the horse, I like going fast on skis, and it all came together really well. For the pros, bragging rights, buckles, and big bucks are up for grabs. At some competitions, prize purses can top $20,000. But for most, the camaraderie of the tight-knit sport is the biggest draw. It's basically a big family, and we come together at this event and say our howdies, get along, drink some beer, and, and go racing. Official ski joring competitions will return to the Rocky Mountains next December. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Julia Griffin. The key is knowing when to let go. And that's the NewsHour for tonight. I'm Judy Woodruff. For all of us at the PBS NewsHour, thank you, and we'll see you soon. You're watching PBS.